introduction. All right. Good morning, everybody. I'm glad to be here. Uh, Rod Bryant is away in North Carolina visiting his grandchildren. And today is an exciting piece because as we study the Torah portion each week, this is the beginning. This is the absolute beginning. Genesis, which is in Hebrew. Genesis is Greek. Genesis is the Greek word for starting something. And here we're starting something. My name is Rabbi Dan Gordon. I'm the rabbi of Temple Beth Torah, where I'm in my 16th year leading that congregation. And Jewish learning is more about possibilities than it is about absolutes. And so what I'm going to be presenting today is about a springboard for discussion. It's not about we're going to find out the final answer. It's not about saying, okay, here's exactly what happened. We can't know exactly what happened. When God said, let there be light, what does you, your mind take you? For years, my mind took me to, there was a switch. Boy, when you come into a dark room and say, let's have some light, you push a button or you flick a switch. But could it have been a little pinprick? Could it have been a dot of light that slowly, slowly, slowly spread? So we're going to try and take a look at the first section of the Torah, Bereshit, the Hebrew for in beginning. And to cover that in 60 or 90 minutes is like trying to create the world in a week. Which perhaps happened. <clears throat> so the Torah teaches us <coughs> what we believe happened. And then there's the other possibilities. In Jewish learning, beyond the Torah, we have the Talmud. The Talmud is the rabbinic discussions that happened years later. Most of them were written between the years 200 and 500 of the Common Era after Jesus' birth. But they were talked about long before that. And the Talmud includes conversations that happened across the generations. And so we learn a little bit from the Torah, a little bit from the Talmud, a little bit from modern commentaries, and a lot from each other. So let's go ahead and hear some of the words. The beginning of the Bible, it says... And I, I'm reading from the Jewish Publication Society translation. In the Hebrew, Bereshit bara Elohim et ha-shamayim v'et ha-aretz. When God began to create heaven and earth, the earth being unformed and void, with darkness over the surface of the deep, and a wind from God sweeping over the water, Just that little bit. What's here already? It says a beginning, but the earth is unformed and void. It doesn't say there was no earth. It was just unformed and void. There was a darkness over the surface of the earth. Something existed. Some commentaries say that this was a beginning of this world. And other worlds had existed before that. A wind from God sweeping over the, over the water. So water was there. Water was part of the beginning. And what's exciting about the Hebrew language is that some words mean many different things. So in this translation it says, a wind from God. The Hebrew word is ruach, which means wind. It also means spirit. And so we think about the wind of God, the spirit of God, perhaps the breath. That something is sweeping over the earth. Now, the other thing to notice when we go from Hebrew to English, the word Elohim. Elohim is God's name, translated here as God. 
But grammatically, the im suffix, the last sound, it's with the, the letters yud, mem, is plural. So we have all these questions of, we say very emphatically, God is one. We are monotheistic. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And at the very beginning, it says Elohim, a plurality. But then, just two words later, Hashemayim. Hashemayim is the sky, and it also has an im. So is it skies? Would that be a more appropriate translation? Or do we think of sky as being multiple already? That there's a piece of sky. There's a piece of sky. These aren't the skies. It's all the sky. And so, is God more than one? Or is God the multiplicity? The amazing combination of all the qualities that bring together. So these are the little nuances that we take when we cover just a few words. Elohim, God. And throughout the whole first chapter of Genesis, that is God's name. We do have many names for God. In the Torah, there are many names for God. Some of them are about different qualities. Shaddai means the Almighty. Hamakom means the sacred place. In our prayers, we say things like Avinu Malkeinu, our Father, our King. We say things like Hakarosh Baruchu, the Holy One, blessed be He. And so there are many ways to connect with God. And sometimes it's about how we are relating in that moment. Hashekhinah is the divine presence. And that is an interesting one because grammatically, Hashekhinah is a feminine word. In Hebrew, all nouns are either masculine or feminine. And so the fact that one of the aspects of God has a feminine grammar is further evidence to say that God is not limited to male or female. God is not limited to one being because one is finite. It's a number. But oneness is infinite. And so it's difficult to say God is one, even though that is what we come to, because the word one in our mind is limited. But to say oneness is a little bit different. We'll get into it a little bit, the letters of how God's name is spelled. And we'll get into the concept of being, which is a little bit different too. But God is not limited. In fact, one of the names of God in our liturgy and in our worship is Ein Sof, which means without end. And so something without end perhaps is also without beginning. When Moses says to God at the burning bush, who are you? And God says, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. Moses says, could you be just a little more specific? And God says, Ehiyah asher ehiyah. I often translate it as, I am that I am. But grammatically more accurate, I will be what I will be. There is the limitlessness. There is the lack of limitation. I will be what I will be is the always. So we've just gone a few words. And then God said in verse 3, God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said, let there be light, and there was light. How is light created? Striking a match? Flipping a switch? 
Light is created with a word. By saying it. We say it, and it is so. Now, if you take this to how we live our lives, if you tell a rumor, you say it and it is so, even if it's a lie. If you speak a word against your fellow human being, you say it and someone will hear it. Someone will believe it. Someone will take your word and make it so. And here is why the very first words of the Bible say, we must be careful with our speech. We must watch what we say. Because if we are like God, if we are created in God's image, we can say something and it becomes so. Sit with that for a moment. And if you say to somebody, what a pretty smile. If you to say, say to somebody, you've enriched my day, you make it so. And words have the power to heal and the power to harm. And God teaches us that in the very beginning of the Torah. God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. Creation is about separation. It's about separation. You don't have light without darkness. You don't have light without darkness. Darkness is what enables us to see the light. Falsehood is what enables us to see the truth. Opposites are what are, enable us to see everything else. Evil enables us to see good. We would never see a star if it was light all the time. In Alaska, they have a difficult time with this. I, I once heard somebody say in Alaska, somebody was arrested, and they were asked, all right, where were you on the night of October 21st through November 15th? Because there's only one night, all winter long. <laughs> So, <laughs> so it's the opposites that make it's the opposites that make us see things. Now, when we think about light versus darkness, we're thinking in terms of absolute. And the separation of time is not absolute. Light blends into darkness. And when we have absolute darkness versus absolute light. Absolute light would be blinding. Absolute darkness, we can't see. But when is it not absolute? On the Sabbath, we have a ceremony called Havdalah. Havdalah comes from this same word. It, it says in the Hebrew, And God separated the light from the darkness. Let me see. That's verse 4. It's a, the, the verb is lehavdil. Lehavdil. Havdil means to separate. Havdala, from the same root, is the separation between the Sabbath and the rest of the week. And yet... When does it start? Is there a moment? Yeah, you can look on your calendar. On a Jewish calendar, it will say, Sabbath ends on this week at 7.15, or 7.17 in Chicago, or 7.19 in Kansas City. And you can look on your calendar, and people have calculated exactly when that is. The sages said, that is when three stars are visible in the sky. 
That is officially when day ends and night begins. Now, those of you who've learned with me before know that I can't resist telling a story now and then. And there's a story about a rabbi who was teaching his students about Havdalah, about how to end the Sabbath, and said, the Sabbath ends, the, the day ends, and the night begins when three stars are visible in the sky. And so one of the students said, well, Rabbi, if day ends and night begins when three stars are visible in the sky, when is it that night ends and day begins? And so the rabbi, like any good rabbi, said, what do you think? <laughs> and so students w began to guess. One said, perhaps it's when from a distance you can tell the difference between a lamb and a goat. And the rabbi said, excellent thought and wrong. <laughs> Another said, perhaps when from a distance you can tell the difference between a fig tree and a date tree. And the rabbi also dismissed that answer. And as they guessed and guessed and guessed, finally one of the students said, okay, rabbi, we can't guess anymore. You tell us. When is it that night ends and day begins? And the rabbi said, when you can look into the eyes of a stranger and see your brother or your sister. Until then, it will always be dark for us. And so we see the separation is not so absolute. Where does water end and land begin? When you walk out onto the beach and your feet are hot on the sand and then they get a little bit cooler because there's a little bit of muddy sand and then you walk a little bit further and your feet are totally wet, when did that change? It's a blending. At dusk and at dawn, there's a blending. And so the absolute of where one thing begins and another thing ends is a blending. And that is also the infinite nature. And so the beginning of the world, where we can say, perhaps it started on this day, 5,700 and, I blanked on what year it is, 5,774 years ago, 5,774 years ago, was that year 365 days? Was that year so many moments? But here we are at the very beginning when God saw that the light was good, God separated the light from darkness, and God called the light day. And the darkness he called night and there was evening and there was morning, a first day. And that's it. A whole day. And what do we have? Light and darkness. Where before there was just darkness, now there's both. And then we move to a second day. And a second day, God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the water that it may separate water from from water, again, separation. And where did some of the water go? Some of the water went up, some of the water went down. God made the expanse, and it separated the water which was below the expanse from the water which was above the expanse. And the water, and it was so, God called the expanse sky, Shamayim. And, the, and there was evening and there was morning, a second day. Shamayim, also plural, an expanse, limitless. And it comes from water, which is Mayim. So Mayim and Shamayim is the water below and the water above, which... Blends. The water below evaporates, forms the clouds, which when they fill up, rain down, which goes back into the water below, which then evaporates again, and life continues in an infinite way. Now, there's something that's different between the first day and the second day. And it's the grade. 
God didn't grade the second day. God graded the first day. Saw that it was good. The second day, God doesn't make a value judgment. We'll get to that in a little bit. God doesn't judge the second day as good. Doesn't say it's bad, but doesn't say it's good. So we're going to find out in a minute why God doesn't say it's good. Is this something you've looked at before? Ever thought about which days were good and which days weren't good? God said in verse 9, Let the water below the sky be gathered into one area that the dry land may appear. And it was so, because God said so. God called the dry land earth, and the gathering of waters he called seas, and God saw this was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, seed-bearing plants, fruit trees of every kind on the earth that bear fruit with the seed in it, and it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, seed-bearing plants of every kind, the trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it, and God saw this was good, and there was evening and there was morning a third day. So on the third day, God says good twice. Made up for lost time. So now we've got three days so far. On the first day, we've got light, and darkness. On the second day, we've got expanse. Sky and water. And what do we have on the third day? We have earth and vegetation. Here are the first three days. Is this enough? Why can't we just stop there? What else do you need besides light, darkness, sky, water, earth, and vegetation? You need someone to use it. These are all resources. So now we need something to make use of the light and the darkness. What do you think would make use of the light and darkness? Well, in verse 14, God's going to give us someone. God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate day from night. They shall serve as signs for the set times, the days of the years. They shall serve as lights in the expanse of the sky to shine upon the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights. The greater light to dominate the day, and the least night to dominate the night, and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the sky to shine upon the earth, to dominate the day and the night, to separate the light from darkness, and God saw this was good. good. And there was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. So on day four, we've got the sun the moon, and the stars, all of which are there to be part of the light and the darkness. The sun reflects the light. And so isn't it interesting to see that we've got light before the sun? It's not just the sun that gives us light. And so we think about what else gives us light. And when you look into a friend's eyes, when you hear a baby cry, when you see a child laugh, this is all part of the light. When you see something grow, when you see a butterfly go from flower to flower, this is part of the light. These are things that are reflecting each other. And when one smile leads to another smile, when one hug transfers energy from a person to another. This is part of the light that we share. 
because the sun's light reflects the star's flicker and it works together. The light of the sun takes it from God's light. God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, birds that fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. God created sea monsters and all the living creatures of every kind that creep, which the waters brought forth in swarms and all the winged birds of every kind. And God saw this was good. God blessed them. First time the word blessing comes up. God blessed them, saying, Be fertile and increase. Fill the waters and the seas, and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, a fifth day. So on day five, we've got fish, birds, sea monsters, to use the sky and the water. Mm -hmm. Then it matches up. You didn't know God was a mathematician, did you? <laughs> it matches up exactly. So who's going to use the earth and the vegetation? Man. I, you, 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 you've read this before, haven't you? <laughs> God said, let the earth bring forth every kind of living creature cattle, creeping things, wild beasts of every kind, and it was so. God made wild beasts of every kind and cattle of every kind and all kinds of creeping things of the earth. God saw this was good. And God said, now but before I get that, did, did you catch why day two was not labeled as good? It wasn't good until there was a purpose for it. Right. Until something was able to grow out of the sky and the water. And that's why it wasn't good until the land and the vegetation and the seeds came about. Okay? So something isn't good until there's a purpose for it. To propagate itself, right? To propagate itself, right. To be able to continue. So the beasts of the creeping things are now good. And then this key. Okay? We could stop right here. We'd stop right here and let the creeping things, I'm going to call them mammals, the cattle and the beasts of every kind, we can call them mammals. We could stop right here. There's enough. There's enough. We don't need anybody else. But, God's not satisfied. God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. They shall rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the cattle, the whole earth, and all the creeping things that creep on the earth. You've got all these things. You need someone to take care of it. You need someone to take care of it, someone who can think about it, someone who can plan about it. And we've got Elohim doing all this. Elohim, that plurality of God. Some say it was God and a committee of angels. That the angels were part of this decision. That's why it says, let us make man in our image. <coughs> Some say it was the angels. And there's a midrash about the angels and the creation of man. A midrash, is this a term you're familiar with? Midrash, of course you are. You've been studying with Rod. <laughs> the Torah is written black fire on white fire. That there's a teaching that says the black is the text of what we're taught happened. The white space is in between is when you read between the lines. That that is the Midrash. How I like to think of it is, if the text of the Torah is what we're taught happened, the Midrash is what 
might have happened. Not necessarily absolute truth, but a story that helps us get to an understanding. So according to this Midrash, the angels had a little debate about whether or not the world was done enough without humankind. There's a lot here. What do you need people to come and mess it up for? And so the, the angel of truth started the argument. The angel of truth said, don't create man. Don't do it. Man is going to be filled with lies. All he's going to do, he's going to tell lies. The angel of truth said, I vote no. The angel of justice, sometimes translated righteousness, tzedek, the angel of justice said, go ahead, create man. He's going to do acts of righteousness, and that's going to enhance the world. We need righteousness in the world. Man will do that. The angel of war said, no, don't create man. He's going to fill the world with war. But the angel of love said he will do acts of love. And so they continue to argue. Now a midrash, in order to be a midrash, there's a quality that a midrash has to have. Is this something you're familiar with? A midrash includes at least one line of sacred text. Something from the Tanakh. Something from the written scriptures. So this Midrash has two lines of sacred text. The first one, it springs from, let us make man in our image. But then it takes a line from the Psalms that says, truth was thrust to the ground. This is what happened in the argument. So you just imagine the angels duking it out and truth is thrust to the ground. And while truth is on the ground and the other ones continue to argue, the Holy One, blessed be he, says, what are you fighting about? While you've been busy arguing, I went ahead and did it. Man is already created. So when I first took a look at this Midrash, I thought about what is the randomness of which angels took which side? That whoever created this Midrash, and it's a classic Midrash, whoever created this Midrash must have put some thought. And I thought about what is truth? The truth and justice were the ones who were arguing with each other. But I'm sorry, and I, I told it a little bit wrong. I didn't mean the angel of war. I meant the angel of peace. It wasn't the angel of war, it was the angel of peace. So truth and justice were arguing with each other. Peace and love were arguing with each other. When you think about it, what is truth and what negates truth? If I tell you 100 true things about myself and then slip in my MBA from Harvard, you could doubt anything else I've said. Because I told one lie, you could wonder if anything else was true. You have a big pot of kosher chicken soup, toss in one ham bone. <laughs> it ain't kosher no more. And so one, one falsehood can ruin a whole lot of truth. And yet, when there's injustice, an act of righteousness can correct injustice. It doesn't make it whole or perfect, but you can right a wrong. You can make something better by doing an act of righteousness. And so, righteousness can eradicate injustice as well as falsehood can eradicate truth. And here is why those two argued. Peace. The angel of peace was against creating man because of acts of war. Well, you can have an awful lot of peace. And one little hateful act 
can destroy everything. Everything's going along just perfectly, and someone tosses a bomb, or stabs somebody in the back, or says a hateful thing, and all of a sudden, an explosion. And the angel of love, we hope and pray that acts of love can turn around acts of hate. And so, in measuring the difference between the evil that falsehood can do versus the righteousness that justice can do, in measuring the difference between the hate that can be created and the love that can correct that. God put all those together and said, let's take a chance. Let's take a chance. We could have an idyllic, human-free world that just continues to feed the animals, or we could have people to bring about some excitement. And so God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. They shall rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the cattle, the whole earth, and all the creeping things on the earth. They, plural. Let us create man in our image, they shall rule. And so, God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. A very confusing line. Did God create man? Or did God create them? Did God create one? Or did God create two? So there's Midrashim about this as well. One of them is that the first human being was hermaphrodite. The first human being had male and female characteristics. And later we get into that separation again and how man is separated from woman. There's another legend of Lilith, who was legendarily Adam's first wife, who not so... Um, surprisingly, turned up years later as the wife of Dr. Fraser Crane. <laughs> it, if you were to compare the classic stories of Lilith with Dr. Lilith Crane in the TV show Cheers and later Fraser, there are a lot of similarities in those classic stories, but I am I am perhaps as much of an expert on sitcoms as I am on Bible, which isn't saying much about either. God blessed them. This is the second blessing. The second blessing. God blessed them and said to them, be fertile and increase. He blessed both humans and animals with the same blessing. Be fertile and increase. Let's get more. Let's get more and fill the world. Fill the earth and master it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and all the living things that creep on the earth. God said, See, I give you every seed-bearing plant that is upon the earth, every tree that has seed-bearing fruit, they shall be yours for food. What are we going to eat? Veggies. 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 Right. right. Yeah. Right. The first human being was, according to the Bible, vegetarian. To all the animals on the land, to all the birds of the sky, and to everything that creeps on the earth, in which there is the breath of life, I give all green plants for food. And it was so. And God saw all that he had made and found it very good. Very good better than good. Everything together is very good once male and female are part of the picture. 
And so, the picture is complete. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. And in six days, the world was done and everything was in it. Six days. So what's missing? What's missing? We've got light and darkness, sky and water, earth and vegetation, sun, moon, stars, fur, fish, birds, sea monsters, mammals and people. What else could come into the world? We're done. The heaven and the earth were finished. Beginning of chapter 2. On the seventh day, God finished the work that he had been doing. He finished the work on the seventh day. But there wasn't anything else created. He finished the work that he had been doing. He ceased on the seventh day from all the work he had done. And then there's another blessing. Vayivarek Elohim et Yom Hashvi'i Vaykadesh Oto. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it God ceased from all the work of creation that he had done, such as the story of heaven and earth as they were created. Holiness. This is the first time the word holy is mentioned. Sky, light, plants, land, water, birds, fish, mammals, cattle, people were all good. All of them together are very good. But there's something missing. Everything's very good. But day seven. Day seven is holy. So, here's a lesson, my friends. Things are good. Time is holy. To take the time to acknowledge all the gifts. There's a story by Rabbi Arthur Waskow in which he has a description of God thinking about what to do next after everything else is created and animals and making different suggestions and Eve says you know, I started making some colors. I, I squeezed red strawberries and green grass, and I started making all these colors on a flat piece of rock, and I started making this beautiful picture. And then I put too many colors on, and it messed it up. And sometimes, Things can be complete before you put too much in it. And so Adam said, maybe you could make not making. Maybe you could make not making. Taking that time. Now, today is Shabbat. What do we do to make time holy? You're doing it. You're doing it by engaging in sacred learning. But just like Shabbat doesn't end all of a sudden, the, the three stars visible in the sky, that's the time that it ends. But you don't have to end it then. The rabbis say, you don't have to end Shabbat until Tuesday. You keep it going. Of course, you're supposed to have three meals on Shabbat, and so that might be a little bit complicated. 
The reason why they say Tuesday is because by Wednesday you have to get ready for the next Shabbat. Right. <laughs> but time, what we do to fill that time, do something different. Rest, engage in sacred learning, but then take that learning and say, when the Sabbath is over, I'm not going to stop with my holy thinking. I'm not going to stop being a holy creature. The same way the light blends into the darkness and the darkness blends into the light, we blend our holiness into the rest of the week. The Talmud says that at the end of our days, we will be asked questions about what about our, our righteousness. And one of the first questions that the Talmud says were to be asked is, were you honest in business? Near the top of the list, were you honest in business? That your whole area of righteousness includes honesty in business. You could spend the entire Sabbath doing sacred things and go out the next day and cheat your neighbor. What does that mean about your Sabbath? If you can take that holy thought from the Sabbath and blend it into the rest of the week, we don't compartmentalize the same way even when we say God is one, we haven't compartmentalized God as being limited, that God is unlimited. And so our holiness is not limited to one day of the week. But we focus on it that day. That's the day that we focus on it, we rejuvenate, we gear up for that level of holiness. Now I want to point out one other thing, and that is, at the end of the first uh, a couple of verses of chapter 2. Chap chapter 2, verse 4 says, Such is the story of heaven and earth when they were created. And then, in the translation it here, it says, When the Lord God made earth and heaven, and all of a sudden, God's got two names together instead of one. In the Hebrew, it's, what, how we would say it is Adonai Elohim. But the first word, the Elohim is the same Elohim that's been all through chapter 1. The letters I'm going to put them on two different sides of the, of the board. Can that all be seen? Mm -hmm. The whole board? Let's just erase this so you can see it better. Yud, hey, vav, hey. The reason why I separated them is because we don't want to erase God's name. But I want you to be able to see the letters. The yud, hey, vav, hey is what's called in modern terms the tetragrammatron which is the four letters that spell out God's name. This is also part of the verb to be. Lihiyot means to be. You have the yud, the he, and the vav in lihiyot. Haya means was. The he and the yud and the he. Yihiya is the future. Will be. And that is what God said to Moses when Moses said, What is your name? I'm sorry. Ehiyeh. Ehiyeh asher ehiyeh. 
I will be what I will be. The future, ongoing, forever. And so, to say God is being, We have a human being. Or we have a human being. The difference between a noun and a verb. We can be a noun and we can be a verb. And God can be a noun and can be a verb. That the being of the continual creation, creation was also not finite. Creation didn't end at the end of the first week. The world is continuing to be created. And we do that as God's partners. We make time holy by doing righteous acts that eradicate the falsehoods of injustice. By doing loving acts that eradicate the hatred of war. And the more we focus on the opposites, the more we blend our lives into righteous living. And so we learn from creation about how to be. The, um, there's a story about a, a rabbi who was leading a service and it, a man brought his non-Jewish friend to the service, and he was explaining everything that was going on. And they stood up at one point, and he asked, what does that mean? And they sat down, and what does that mean? And they opened the, the ark to bring out the Torah, what does that mean? And he explained every little thing that went on, and people took their prayer shawls and touched the Torah, and he, what does that mean? And then the rabbi got up to give his sermon, and he took off his watch, and he placed it on the podium, and the friend asked, what does that mean? And the man said, that doesn't mean a thing. <laughs> I, I, I heard from Garrison Keeler that there is a 12-step program for clergy that's called On and On and On. <laughs> and so at this point, I'd like to just take a look at creation here. How the sun, moon, and stars use the light how the fish, birds, and sea monsters use the sky and the water, how people and animals use the earth and the vegetation, and how we are all being to try and be like the Holy One who gave us this time to be holy. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. So another interesting aspect of the male and the female, that you have Adam is Adam. Adam came from Adama, the ground, the earth. Adam is filled with Adam. Yeah, it's just a, it's just a different way. In the same letter mem, when it comes at the end of a word, has, uh, it just looks different. Adam is filled. Sorry. Adam is filled with dumb, which is blood. And the blood is red. It's the color of dome. Okay? Adam, the man, comes from Adama, the earth, is filled with blood. These all have the same root. Dalad mem, dalad mem, dalad mem, dalad mem. Okay? Got that? 
But then, the man gets a new name. Adam is humankind. Adam is mankind. Adam is all of it. But specific man is each. Specific to woman is Isha. Okay, and that's where it says that the man said, Vayomer Adam, the man said, This one at last is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. Lizot Yikra Isha. This one I call the same word Kara or Yikra will call woman. Isha. So each of these has three letters. Aleph Yod Shin, Aleph Shin He. So obviously, three letters in each, two of them are the same. There's something in man that is not in woman. There is something in woman that is not in man. There is something in man that is not in woman. There is something in woman that is not in man. Back to where we had before, God's name, yud He vav He. What is in woman that is not in man is the He. What is in man that is not in woman is the Yud. Hallelujah. This is Yah. This is God. Hallelujah means praise God. Yah is the first half of God's holy name. Man has part of God, but not all of God. Woman has part of God, but not all of God. There's a piece, and, and if you wanted to look at how the Yud fits into the hay graphically you can, but you don't have to. But man and woman fit together. Now, if you take the two letters they have in common without the aspect of God, you have H, which is fire, which is something that warms, something that comforts, Something that cooks or destroys. Or destroys. Mm -hmm. When out of control, fire destroys. And so, H, the fire, is good. It's passionate love. It's the sharing of a connection. It's man and woman taking the best of who man is and the best of who woman is? When you add the pieces of God, it all comes together. Without God, it can destroy. Aish. And so, this, this little lesson here, it's not in the Torah. I didn't make it up. I don't remember who taught it to me first. But it's a lesson that we can hold on to, to remember about what happens when we bring the best.